So this next episode was a bit longer than the others that I do, but I had Mark McCormack come on the podcast and this bloke is so in-depth with the knowledge that he has learnt which I'll speak about, but I just had to keep it rolling and I'd like to get him back on again. So Mark McCormack, he's the most humble, genuine guy that you'll ever meet. I literally think he's put on this earth to make it a better place. He went through like his, um, like between the age of 13 and his late 20s, he went through like a spiritual discovery process where he looked at all different philosophies And then by the time he got into his late 20s, he came across a philosopher named Hegel. And in the end, after 3,100 hours of studying this guy's work, he's he's come up with all these different concepts and different spiritual lessons that he's put out for free because he believes this stuff's going to change the world. And I do too, to be honest. But, mate, this philosopher Hegel and the way that Mark has grasped his understanding he's like woven together philosophy over hundreds of years all into this one system that like supports itself in his words like logically scientifically and spiritually all in one so this is really good this is what the world needs at the moment and I hope you enjoy it so dig in all right we might get stuck straight in so thanks for being here uh, yeah, having a look at your, uh, your spiritual, well, what would you call them? Sorry, your spiritual sessions that you do. Yeah, the sessions of spirit. There's about 38 of them. And they're unreal. I'd, I'm really keen to actually like look at these. I had a look at your Facebook page and you're offering all this stuff for free to people. 100% free. I'm, I'm glad you noticed. I could probably write books or maybe even apply to do a PhD on some of this information, but I'm, I'm aiming for something different that's really hard to achieve. And I've positioned my life in such a way that there's a chance we could achieve it, but it'll be a little bit risky. But usually when you want to change the world, you have to, you have to give something. And when you give something that's valuable, uh, it creates an, uh, uh, a wave of energy that can inspire people to believe in the movement itself. And that inspiration carries an energy upwards that can make changes that are impossible for other people, uh, movements, events. Uh, you can do incredible things with this kind of uh, idea of belief. And uh, I'm trying to trigger that and say, okay, look, this is something very rare. I'm willing, I see that there's problems in the world. I think that we can, we can change it, but we have to do something that's remarkable and unpredictable because if you're predictable, if you're, if you're working with the ordinary, you know, landscape of how the problem's unfolding, then you're probably not going to develop a real solution, a fundamental solution to get to the core. So what I'm thinking is nobody's going to give this much value away for free. There's a little bit of a caveat though, that with this kind of information, it releases the spirit. And what you get is um, sort of a volunteer, uh, a volunteer movement that sustains itself. And then eventually we transition it into the new global economy, which is based on a whole bunch of cool stuff. But you're right. Thank you for noticing. Um, <laughs> it's true. I am giving it's away true. for free. All 38. Hey, and as well as that, I believe in like a great karmic um, energy coming back towards you as well. So, and one thing I've noticed, the common thing that when I speak to people on this podcast, especially people that are into spirituality, is they're all doing work to benefit other people. So, isn't that incredible? Absolutely. So, when I tried to YouTube some of this information, I don't think it's common knowledge. What you're going to find is uh, it's, I've been on the spiritual path for about 20 years now. I had my sort of spiritual epiphany when I was about 13 years of age. And I was, um, I was born onto the poverty line here in Canada. And, you know, my family was a little bit of a, it was an unusual, we were positioned unusually. And we ended up kind of rising up through poverty. I ended up going to university, first one in my family. And... Um, my spiritual awakening kind of happened by a realization of what my circumstances were. 
And then it sort of led me down this unconventional path of learning all these things that you're seeing in the sessions um, that I kind of threaded together in a unique way. I thought it was unique, actually, up until about six years ago. And uh, what all my meandering had led me to from 13 until about 28 years of age, um, you know, I went through New Age, I went through Buddhism, I went through Christianity, Islam, I went through, you know, Alan Watts, I went through uh, physics, uh, formal philosophy, I went through a whole bunch of different areas. And I ended up at uh, a philosopher named Hegel. And Hegel, you can find quite a bit about Hegel. Uh, but nobody understands him. And so what I ended up uh, achieving was all this background research that I had done gave me the sort of breadth of understanding to grasp the insight in his writing. And that kind of explaining Hegel with this kind of broadness is what is uncommon today. If you read Hegel in a purely uh, academic philosophical way, what I found is that over the last 200 years, amazing people like the greatest minds over the last 200 years have tried to tackle Hegel and when I read their version of it compared to my own direct reading I found out what the problem is nobody has really understood this guy because what he wrote was so immense that at first the ordinary thinking can't it'll paint over it it's it's like torture for the ego or the little ego mm -hmm. the finite ego you have to have a fortitude of mind. You have to have a, a developed spirit that gives you the emotional resilience to actually stay the course. And what I think happened is these geniuses, they couldn't compute him quickly because usually when you're a genius in philosophy, you know, most things just click, you know, quick, 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 quick. Mm -hmm. But with Hegel, he wrote it in such a way that even if you're a genius, it does something radically. It, it transcends your linear thinking. And what had happened is these guys, I don't think, put the time in. I just feel like, you know, you have to publish papers, you know, academia is a bit of a, it's a bit of a game. It's a, a bit of an industry, especially now. So I think that um, nobody just put the, the real time in. And when they did interpret him, it was in like a, a one-sided way where the full freedom of spirit that he wrote with um, was truncated into these bite-sized bits where it was easy to attack him and make him look like he was a, a finite thinker or a limited thinker. And I, because of all the spiritual background, was able to read him from multiple perspectives and realize what he had really done. And so this is me trying to give it to people for free and saying, no, actually, what he had done is more incredible than anything I had ever read. Like over the last, I think I calculated around 73,000 hours of spiritual study, philosophy, nothing comes even close to what this guy had done. Like this is 200 years ago. People are still trying to figure out what he wrote. And when it clicked for me, when it started to click for me, I just couldn't believe it. Like, I don't know how this guy did it. Um, I'm not sure what your background is, but like, it's almost like taking everything that everybody else had said over the past 3000 years and like, not just reiterating it in a paraphrase, but he literally comprehended it and took entire like hundreds of years of, of philosophy and took its principle in its absolute clarity. And then everybody else after or around that, he stitched them together into a mega system that like su supports itself. It's the most amazing spiritual thing I've ever read. And I think he's the only one that's ever done it logically and scientifically and spiritually. Buddha, Jesus, all these amazing divine figures. I think they grasped it, but they couldn't express it with that level of clarity that we now appreciate today because we have science and logic. But they had to use poetry. They had to use neologisms. They had to use whatever was available that people in their age could understand. And now it's just like to see it in scientific form is, it's like enlightenment in like four books. It's really incredible. So anyway, that's the long story of like why it might be hard to find, you know, information on them. It's almost like uh, the people before or after him, the philosophers, they were standing on a mountain and they were trying to describe the view to everyone on the other side where Hegel, he just went up and took a picture <laughs> yeah. And they looked at the picture and they said, oh, surely it's not that easy to believe. But So how did you go? When was the moment when it all kind of clicked with you? You must have been like frustration in through trying to read and dig through this stuff to have that like breaking moment where everything clicked and you realized. It's, a, it's kind of a weird story. Um, 
that's sometimes why you know synchronicity is leading you to the truth because it's happening in a way that you couldn't artificially create. It has a life to it. So the truth is that Hegel had passed, had crossed my path twice before the third time that it clicked. So the first time was almost right in the beginning of my spiritual awakening when I was kind of breaking out of this like cynicism and like, oh, poverty, you know, life is meaningless. We're a bunch of rats with no, there's not even cheese at the end of the, in the maze, right? So it's like completely <laughs> pointless. Uh, a bit of a nihil, I guess that was my nihilistic moment. Um, but I, I made a big transition, like I had a big switch there. And Hegel actually came in a book called Sophie's World. So one of my high school teachers, I think, or one of my junior high, somebody introduced me to a book. I think it was a high school teacher, actually. So it might have been a few years later. But he, he said, look, you, you have some ideas, but you should really read this book called Sophie's World. It goes through all these philosophers, an interesting story. One of them is Hegel. And when I read Hegel then, he didn't sound anything different from all the other philosophers in this book. It just sounded like, oh, he's just saying some philosophical stuff, nothing profound. So I totally dismissed him, like everybody else usually does. And then about, I don't know, something like a decade later, half a decade later, something like that, five to ten years, he crossed my path again in university. And he came across my path in a formal philosophy course. I was taking philosophy 101, metaphysics, you know, the basic courses. And he gets mentioned along with Kant. But when I listen to the people talking about Hegel, it was, again, kind of like nothing profound. He was just another philosopher. Like, it's like he had, he was just like another guy who had an idea and he was just using fancy language to talk about it. So I missed him a second time in a more academic setting with a more mature mind. I still couldn't recognize what he had said. And it's partly because I never read him directly. I was trying to read him through other people because everybody, the one thing that everybody understands about Hegel is that he is somehow the epitome of something they don't know exactly what he said but he's like he's like the final boss of philosophy you know you work your way up and like when you get to hegel and you think you have the answer he shows you that you don't have the answer and you start questioning <laughs> your entire reality and you're like what have i been doing with my life it was the third time where i was like a couple of years after this i had started a group uh, to it was called make poverty history i was trying to figure out why was there so much poverty in the world when we have this like amazing you know, level standard of living. Like we have, um, you know, the internet, we have cars, we have smartphones, we have all this kind of stuff. Why is there a billion people in abject poverty on the verge of starvation? And then stra even more strange, why is there another billion people who are obese and dying of heart attacks because they have too much food to eat and junk food? Hmm. So we're like experiencing this schism, this schizophrenia. And I started this group and I was trying to figure out how do you build a team where people won't burn out. And I was dating a girl at the time and trying to convince her to kind of get on board with this sort of um, bigger thinking. And uh, she, she was putting me in the, these situations that I couldn't philosophically understand. Usually I'm pretty insightful, but I couldn't make sense of what was happening. So one of my friends one day sent me an article about Gandhi and it just, it was about double binds. And I'd never heard of double binds before. But when I saw the word, something in my intuition clicked. It was like, that, that word feels like what I'm going through. I feel like some, whatever a double bind is, I feel like I'm in a bind. So when I looked it up on Wikipedia, it started talking about dialectics. I'm like, okay, dialectics, I know that has to do something with philosophy. And when you look it up, there's like Hindu dialectics, Buddhist dialectics, like dialectics are as old as philosophy itself. And I kind of read what these guys were saying about double binds and like, you know, it made sense, but it wasn't like anything incredible. When I read Hegel's version, though, like something happened where I broke through that superficial understanding that I saw the first two times. It was like I read what he had said about oppositions. And that little paragraph that I read was so accurate. It resonated with me. I just like that's exactly what I'm experiencing. It's like. The, it's not the when you read him it sounds like gibberish but i think the truth is that he's writing with such razor sharp spiritual precision that you see your confusion in his words if you're not that clear but if you do have a clear thought in your mind you see it in him instantly and that happened to me and it's just like it was like a fractal echo it just like kept going and i was like whoa I have to read the rest of what this, if the rest of it is all like this, I have to read him directly. No more reading him through other people. 
And it was when I actually read him directly that I started to unravel what he had really achieved. And it just kept going. Like, it's still going today. I think what he wrote was infinite. So that's where it kind of started. It was with this girl, I, this woman I was dating. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. And yeah, it uh, led me down the rabbit hole of Hegel. Well, that's what I was about to say. It's almost like a, the white rabbit, you know, that leading you down the, the rabbit hole and it's taking you to where you need to be and you arrive at the destination. But we're blessed. I think we're lucky to have people like you that are willing to put these works into your words and explain it to people like myself who would, if I read his, his work, I'm sure I could read it for 10 years straight and I would not get the meaning that you do out of it because you seem like a very academic and intelligent person. Well, I would say the same about you. <laughs> oh, you have a more of a, um, a hip hop vibe. But I mean, your questions already are so good. I'm like, okay, he's done some homework here. I, you're not the only one to sort of um, experience this this kind of energy of Hegel. Once I had that epiphany, I struggled just like everybody else. Um, actually, when the pandemic started, I made a serious commitment to like get into him. Uh, and what had happened was for about 1,500 hours, 1,500, like day after, I did it for like a whole oh. year. Just, I was actually working, I don't know if I even want to say the name, but I will. I was working at Uber. Uber is an extremely exploitive organization, unfortunately. I think there's good people working, like good people everywhere. We're just trapped in systems. So whatever system that they're exper experimenting with was um, very oppressive to me and millions of other people around the world, actually. Mm -hmm. So part of me thinks that there's an urgency now because these apps are growing and it kind of incentivized me to really go hard into Hegel, like really speed up my understanding because Uber is moving at light speed internationally. They're moving into tons of different, they're basically taking over the world. Yeah. So I, um, you know, if, if wealth and if wealth inequality wasn't so extreme, if it wasn't at all time global highs, I wouldn't be as concerned, but I've been studying poverty for about, I don't know, 12 years now, and it's just getting more and more extreme. So I was reading Hegel at the beginning of the pandemic in this sort of desperate mode to figure out what are we missing in our society that's creating systems like this that's separating our spirit, right? Yeah. And uh, when I started, I think it was January or something like that, every day while I was in the car, like doing deliveries, going home every day for like 10, 15 hours, I put on this audio book while I was driving and I just like listened to his lesser logic for like 11 hours straight and like I'd pause it. Sometimes it would take me a hundred hours to go through the recording, but you don't, for me personally, I didn't understand really anything for 1500 hours. Wow. That was months and months and months of just every day. Every, I put my life in such a position that I could do it every day. No kids yet. Um, there was no distraction. So I literally was able to do it continuously. So my mind wouldn't forget or be saturated with other ideas. Yeah. And that's what it took. I literally did that for months and months and months and months and months. And um, at 1500 hours, finally, the big ideas, like the macro ideas, started to create like islands of understanding in my, sub like in my, I guess my memory, where like across this whole system, it kind of circles back on itself. You don't realize that in the beginning, but I started to see a curve forming with little islands of like sanctuary amongst absolute despair. Like you literally feel like you don't know anything. And he says that in his writings. He's like, when you have ordinary understanding and you're reading what he writes, he's like, it's, it's like pulling the rug out from underneath you. And it's like ordinary thinking doesn't know where in the world it is. It's like completely lost. And that's, he says, you have to feel like this kind of despair because in the beginning, you're so kind of confused. You, you think you know things, but actually you're confused. When you start to gain this clarity, it's so immense that it took me that many hours just to get like a couple of little islands to kind of hold on to and start building the concepts. Cause he like rattles, he takes everything you thought, you know, and he like loosens it up and he like rattles it. And then it kind of gets disorganized. And then you're like, where am I? Like, what was my life before this? Mm -hmm. And then what happens after 1500 hours for me anyway, it's been about 3000, 3100 is it starts getting better. So there's an alignment that starts to occur. And it's this kind of like, right ordering of things. Buddha talks about this too. It's like the right ordering of things. Everything has its place. He, your, your mind starts to 
do that for you. It's like a sub, it's so immense. I could only do it subconsciously at first. And then it comes to you in like trickling epiphanies and intuitions, but it starts building and filling in these gaps. So for me, it took 1500 hours just to get to that first part of stability. But I think we can drastically speed that up without losing the, the experience of it. So that's why I think, okay, Hegel had said when he was alive, he said the, the lectures that he was giving were crucial. He wrote these masterpieces and he claimed to sum up all the totality of all human knowledge in like four books. Cause he said, you know what, when you don't know what you're talking about, you can write forever. Like there was a couple of scholastics in the middle, middle mid evil ages that wrote like 21. So when he was alive, he wrote these masterpieces that he said he summed up all of human knowledge in four books. The scholastics wrote 21 volumes per guy. And they did that for a thousand years. And, you know, Chris, uh, Hegel declared himself to be a Christian. And you're like, okay, why, you know, he was blasting these scholastics and saying negative things about them. But if he's a Christian, like that was supposed to be like the, the epitome of Christian theology. Like it was building itself. And he said, you know, they wrote a lot of stuff that, was repeating or it wasn't really getting to the heart of things and he explains why that is he said they made god or the the absolute a beyond and his philosophy says no this absolute this um this knowledge this divine knowledge you could say this true philosophical wisdom is actually imminent it's absolutely present we're just not clear enough to see it mm -hmm. and so he's forcing your mind to start seeing that clearly but he says if you try and read it directly in his books you'll it's disheartening. So he said his lectures were absolutely critical to help ordinary consciousness like get in there. And um, he like started rising to fame because his lectures were that profound. He wasn't even a great speaker. Apparently he was like a little bit of a, he had a stutter or he like was kind of a quiet speaker. It wasn't like it was like Martin Luther King where, you know, he was just preaching and doing, you know, amazing speeches. It was the absolute resonance of his words that he was choosing that was like resonating with the spirit inside of people like the truth inside of people whatever you want to call it whether you're atheistic um scientific spiritual religious his words were calling that out in people and he says if you're gonna do the same thing if you're gonna try and teach his philosophy the power of the word is really important or else people will just give up you kind of have to use familiarity to kind of get like break the ice and get into this clarity. And so I'm realizing that that's a role that I can start playing um, because I put the work in. Like, I think anybody can understand it. It's actually the ironic part or the counterintuitive part is that once you get past that first step, that's the hardest part. It actually starts getting easier and easier and easier. And the complexity that you see in his writing actually starts turning into a simplified form of thinking that's even more simple than your previous form where you thought everything made more sense. Yeah. So there's this, this counterintuitive, like as it gets more complex, it actually starts to feel more simple. And that's because of the clarity. So I'm thinking what I can do is I can get people started. Like I still have, who knows, another 3000 hours to really get the foundations of Hegel. But I know enough now to give them these islands of sanctuary where they can kind of like start reading himself, uh, reading Hegel themselves and then start building this new spirit that he was talking about. And my goal is to sort of just lay that foundation and say what the mistakes were of all these other 200 years of philosophers who sort of like said, Hegel was not worth it. He was sexist. He was uh, racist. He was antiquated. You know, all these types of things that make people not want to read them. I'm going to come say, no, actually, here's what was really going on. And then here's the, the a foundation of where the profoundness can begin for you. And you don't have to basically torture yourself for 1500 hours to yeah. get those first insights. Yeah, I feel that you've gone a step further. You're giving people the ability to integrate his work into their life. Because you go through a stage of like reading. I, I went through, when I dug into spirituality, maybe like five years straight of just trying to cram as much knowledge into my brain as I could. And I eventually started to fall off the bandwagon of spirituality because I never integrated any of it. I had all the information, but wasn't using it to implement it into my life. And I think I just confused myself with how many different like subjects I was looking at, conflicting beliefs and views. And I just didn't have the, 
the pathway into integrating it. But you've laid it out. Like you've got lectures. And how often do you re release these lectures? Is it weekly? Uh, right now, you're saying such perfect things. I have so much to say on what you just said. But yeah, it's, it's, I'm doing them every day until the end of this month. And then I think if we start building the spirit, like the momentum starts being called out from people, then it'll start to pick up momentum and more and more people start asking questions. And in my experience as an organizer, like I was doing activism for about 10 years, you start to pick up steam. And if you don't uh, kind of balance yourself, you get overwhelmed and you have burnout. Yeah. And so we learned how to kind of like address burnout with flow states. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach every day until the end of the month. And then I'm going to do it every second day until basically the end of the summer or until I think August 17th. And then by that point, all 38 sessions should be covered. And I want to give people, no matter what, um, at what session you jump in, maybe you'll jump in at like session 25 or somebody will watch this and jump in uh, who knows where. I want to repeat all the prior sessions in some way where we start creating a comprehensive understanding, where we start kind of addressing this problem we're all experiencing, which is that this information overload is starting to become completely overwhelming. It's like the internet, these apps, our phones constantly being connected, and the research is just like constantly building in all these different ways. It's like people in their own fields can't even keep up with the discoveries in their own fields, in their own specializations, never mind trying to understand the totality of what human humanity is uncovering. But this is the problem that Hegel solved. I experienced the exact same thing as you. After 20 years, like I couldn't even hold another philosopher in my mind. It's like there's just too many. And I it was starting to fade for me. Like you go and study somebody else and the other one starts to fade. And you have to memorize them by rote memorization because like there might be some commonality between a couple of authors, but these ones seem to be totally different. And like you have to memorize them by rote and there's no real order to them. It's like you just have to like use brute mem like memorizing force. And yeah. that's really cognitive demanding on human beings. So what Hegel said is actually there's a life to the way that real philosophy works, that real spirituality works. There's an inner world, there's an inner dimension that links everything in this kind of spiritual unity, this necessity, this scientific um, clarity. And he says, when you grasp the inner unity of things, all these disparate, all these opposite, all these completely overwhelming philosophies actually get put in their right order and distilled into their principles where like they're actually repeating themselves a lot, but they're putting it in different codings and because there's a bunch of different presentation styles in like the sensuous world. It's technically infinite. You can actually blow your mind apart because it's, it never ends. So if you don't grasp the essence of things, we're going to continue to experience this incredible pressure that's only going to continue to grow because the information age is exponential. So this essence that Hegel is giving, this genuine philosophical clarity, I think is one of the ways to enter, enter into this flow state with abundance. And without it, we're going to be experiencing the opposite, which is anxiety and depression. So I totally feel you, man. That's exactly where I was before Hegel. And now I'm starting to get this kind of like relief. So I'm really hoping to give that to people if they come to all 38 sessions. Might look overwhelming, but I think they'll start to experience this kind of inner unity happening because I made the sessions grow into each other. It kind of starts here and they link upwards and sort of get to a conclusion where I think it'll inspire people to want to change the world, not just theoretically. Once you have the spirit come out of you, it's a practical spirit. You actually can change the world. And so by the end of it, I hope to instill a bit of a confidence in people that this essence is that powerful that we can embody it. So it, it, it will branch out, the knowledge that you give to people could almost branch out into all areas of their life. It is. Hegel said he, the sum total of all human knowledge he put into his encyclopedia. There's three sections to it. Science of logic, philosophy of nature, and philosophy of spirit. And they actually circle back on themselves. So the sum total of all human knowledge is really these universals that circle back and complete themselves. So the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning. And every single one of them is absolutely eternal and essential. All other forms of human experience of knowledge are just a filling in of this, mm. this sort of absolute backbone. And that's kind of what I think is missing in academia today. We gotta- Yeah. I, I've you know? been, while you've been talking, I've been looking at it with the analogy of like martial arts because I, 
I compete in martial arts and it's like things go full circle if you don't quite have something at the start like I just had my sixth uh pro fight and I ended up losing that fight but now I've gone full circle back to the beginning again like I'm working on the footwork and the basic things that I should have had from the start and it's almost like this work is the same as that you need to have a good foundation and a good base and then from there it just you start adding on I love that (laughs) that's a great analogy (laughs) Sorry to hear about your fight. You'll win the next one. Sounds with your kind of attitude. You're only you're just gonna grow. I can sense. Hey, I it. feel with this sort of philosophy, this may help me as well. It's a when I do prepare for uh, fights, I do a lot of inner work, and I think this time it, I definitely was lacking on the inner work. A lot of the time, it's been through. I I will use uh, psychedelics in solitude to really analyze the fight that I need to what I need to do in that fight and I seem to get some sort of wisdom that comes through that I feel is almost external from me I can't see how it can come from inside my own brain but whatever that information is it definitely leads me down the right path to do the right work in order to win that fight but I look at that as just the spirit of nature in all things and here it is again in what you're talking about is the spirit in itself coming through to me now and for me to be able to explain to other people, giving them the steps and the methods to start working towards creating a better life for themselves. So that is the end of episode one, and thanks for tuning in. But we did have a few technical difficulties throughout this podcast, so it's going to be easier for me to release it in a few part series where it won't seem as jumbled and things will make more sense to you in that way. So thank you and episode two is going to be epic.